Okay, hello everybody in internet land, and hello everyone. We are going to start ocean circulation now. i got to turn lights off. This game, I hate this game. Yeah. Oh, maybe this is how it's supposed to be. Yeah, this is it. This is, right? Is this? Yeah. There we go. That's it. That's the ticket. Okay. All right, so hello everyone, and we're doing ocean circulation, so you go lecture assignment number 18, and we're going to get this done today, so we're going to be five, after today we'll be five lectures away from the end, summer break. Okay, so uh, circulation of the oceans, this is, do you see all the little swirlies in here? So little swirlies remind you of anything, all those little swirlies? So, so look at all like the wind pattern. Remember we looked at the global wind patterns, and then we op I opened that like real time global wind patterns app on online. And we were looking at. So hopefully it looks a little bit like that. Maybe you might notice it looks a little bit like that. So circulation of the oceans. We're going to learn all about that over the next uh, basically this week. Okay, and I guess I hope I hope you won't find it too complicated. Um, but anyway. What are ocean currents? So ocean currents is the mass movement of, of water through the oceans. And you know that, of course, and we're going to get into different kinds of currents, okay? And it can either be vertical or horizontal. So there can so that means that you got to start thinking in three dimensions, because we can have vertical movement across the ocean surface. But we can also have movement. We, we actually have currents that are circulating water and going down deep into the water. So we're going to talk about both types. Today we're going to mostly focus on surface currents. But then next time, I guess Wednesday, we're going to be talking about currents that go down deep into the ocean. Those are called thermocaline currents. Okay, They're driven by density rather than wind. So you know, long ago, mariners realized that the ocean isn't just like a big puddle of water sitting there totally stagnant. That, you know, there's actually water movement. It's not really strong. You know, the currents are maybe only, the stronger currents are maybe only two miles per hour. But um, they, they are there, okay? And they can really help sailors you know, navigate across, across the oceans and really pick up their speed, right? So two, two miles per hour is precious. Uh, so they, they realized long ago, sailing vessels realized long ago that they could use these currents. It wasn't really broadly recognized until maybe the 1800s or 17, maybe 1700s that these currents are they exist and they can be utilized. Um, one kind of very poignant historical example, I guess I could say historical, but it wasn't very long ago. It was in the 90s. Uh, there was this big tanker ship called the Evergreen Ever Laurel, and it uh, I don't know exactly what happened, but it sank. And it released, I kid you not, like 92,000 rubber duckies into the ocean. I kid you not. It was very strange. I don't know why they had, I guess. Anyway, there were a lot of rubber duckies. Uh, 92, oh no, not 92, 28,000, sorry. Uh, so it released these 28,000 rubber duckies into the ocean. And guess what? The ocean currents picked those up and took them all over the world. And you actually got kind of an interesting visualization of what the ocean currents are via the rubber duckies. Okay, so, so it, it actually sank here off the coast of Hong Kong, and then it made it all the way, you know, pretty, it made it to Tacoma, Washington. There you go, and off the coast of Washington. In Alaska, you know, happened, got there pretty fast in Alaska, look, November 1992, right? Uh, it got found in Chile and Argentina, got found in Australia, all the way, and look, up to 2007, the rubber duckies were still landing in, in uh, the Iberian Peninsula off the coast of Spain. So it's kind of crazy. These things have been traveling across the globe for, for decades now. I don't know, maybe they're still around. They're still, I have to check up on this, see if they're, they're still finding these things. But they're all driven by these ocean currents. So it's the mass movement of ocean water, like I said, either horizontally or vertically. That's the definition you should have. Okay, so that's what you can you see that? Oh, okay. Kaya kind of squinted. <laughs> oh, is it? Oh yeah. Okay. 
All right, now, now like I said, um, there are two kinds of currents. Now, we're used to thinking of like the ones that go across the surface. So there's surface currents, which is only about 10% movement in the top, like 10% of the ocean water, okay? So you're talking about maybe like the first 400 meters of the ocean water, they're being, they're being moved around and driven by the wind, okay? But there's also other kinds of currents that are kind of more invisible to us. Uh, but they're very, very important. And these are like the deep, these are the deep currents that are moving. Remember I said you could have horizontal currents, the ones that are going horizontally across the surface, but then you can have vertical ones that are going, you know, up and down. And so these are called thermohaline currents. Thermohaline currents, they're, they're called that because they're based on density differences. It's moving because, not because of like wind, but because of density differences, okay? So the density is moving it up or down and due to buoyant forces, and then it'll travel. Often it'll go down and go along the seafloor and go back up like that. So you gotta start thinking now in kind of like three dimensions of the ocean so you can understand currents, okay? So today we're gonna mostly focus on surface currents and then we'll get into deep hailing currents, uh, thermohaline currents later on uh, Wednesday. Okay, so we got all that, that's number two. Now let's, like I said, let's get into surface currents. So surface currents moving the top like 400 meters um, so what drives this, if you had to guess, what do you think drives the surface currents? Mm -hmm. The wind, right? So that's going to be the major factor, but there's going to be other things going on too. So wind is one of them. The next thing is Earth's rotation. So that's the Coriolis force, right? So, there, so we have the wind, we have the Coriolis effect, and then we also have another thing. We have also just like the location of the continents. Okay, that plays a role too. And in fact, you're going to see I only ask for three right now, right? Um, oh, actually, I don't even ask for three. I just say number three, what drives surface currents, right? So there's three things. But there's actually, you're going to see in a few moments, there's even more than that because gravity plays a role and... Uh, there's these things called, this just gets kind of crazy. There's these things called geostrophic effects, and I'm going to explain that later. So that plays a role too. But right now, just make sure you know, okay, wind, Coriolis effect, also the location of the continents, that's all going to play a big role, okay? So you know that the first, most important thing is wind, okay? Wind is controlling these currents. But you hopefully now remember all of these major wind patterns, okay? So think back to the last lecture. I hope you remember, what are some of those major wind patterns we talked about? Trade winds, okay? And the other kind of big wind belt that we, westerlies, right? So the trade winds and the westerlies, okay? Now I want you to take a look at this. We've got the trade winds here. Remember, they're always blowing. Which direction? They're blowing from the east to the west the westerlies are blowing to the higher latitudes to the west to the east, okay? So that's gonna be a first driving factor. So you know it's never gonna be easy and simple because if you came at this just guessing without having prior knowledge, you might just guess that the currents are just gonna follow the air, the air cycle, like, like follow the winds, right? But that's not exactly what happens. It gets a little more complicated than that because there's Coriolis effect, right? Coriolis effect affects anything, any fluid that's moving across the surface of the Earth. So what are the trade winds? The trade winds are the winds that are blowing uh, kind of a lot, kind of near the tropics, in the tropics to the equator, and they're blowing from the west, sorry, backwards, from the east to the west, pardon me. What are the westerlies? The westerlies are the winds that are at higher latitudes, maybe around centered around 40 degrees to 50 degrees north, south, and they are blowing from the west to the east, so the opposite direction of the trade winds. Okay, so those are the big major wind belts that are controlling, well, I shouldn't say controlling, but they're driving the currents. They're the driving force of the currents. 
So ocean surface currents are controlled by a number of factors. Surface winds, Coriolis effect, gravity, sun's heat is another thing that's going to play a role here. And we'll see how all this plays out. Okay. Now let's take a look. We're going to zoom in and look at this one thing uh, called a gyre. And a gyre is a giant, just like remember we had the Hadley cell? Do you all remember the Hadley cell? That's like a big, you can almost think of it as a big, uh, it's a convection cell, of course, in the atmosphere. But you could almost think of it as like analogous to the gyres in the ocean. So the gyres are kind of like big circulation patterns that are in the oceans. We have six gyres, okay? The first one that we're going to look at, or I shouldn't say the first one we're going to look at, but the one that we're going to look at in detail because it's close to us is the North Atlantic gyre. Okay, so this is a diagram of the North Atlantic gyre. There you are. Now the North, so a, what is a gyre? Right, what is a gyre? So a gyre is just a big circulation pattern, a big, I guess you could just, a circulation pattern in the, in the oceans, okay? It's, it encompasses a whole ocean, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a circulation pattern you get encompassing an entire ocean. It's not just a little local regional effect. Now here's this North Atlantic gyre. Notice that the gyre consists of four different currents. And we have a name for all these different currents. So we're going to have a name for all the different gyres. Okay, Most of them have very, very predictable names. Okay, The one in the North Atlantic is called the North Atlantic gyre. The one in the South Atlantic is called South Atlantic gyre. Okay. The one in the Indian Ocean is called the Indian you know, They have this is very predictable. Okay, so, so they shouldn't be hard to remember those. Um, the only one that has kind of a funny name is the, the southern, the gyre in the southern ocean, which is called the um, westward drift. But anyway, uh, windward drift, sorry. North Atlantic gyre has these four currents, so it consists of four currents. Maybe you've heard of the Gulf Stream. Has anyone ever heard of that current, the Gulf Stream current? Very, very famous current, very important for the history of our country, by the way. So we have the Gulf Stream current, then streaming across, we have the North Atlantic current, and then we have the Canary current, and that's because it comes down across the Canary Islands. Canary Islands are off, off the coast of, of Spain, in West Africa. And then we have the North Equatorial current that goes pretty close to the equator. Okay. So those are the four currents you should, and you should draw those all in. Now take a look at the colors. So the Gulf Stream current, if you had to guess, would you say what, do you think the Gulf Stream current is kind of warm or cool or what? It's very warm, right? So that's why it's shown in red. So the, the colors are actually trying to kind of show you the temperature. So the Gulf Stream, very, 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 very warm water. The Gulf Stream you can see actually comes out of the Gulf. So the Gulf Stream is literally streaming out of the Gulf of Mexico, which is very warm water, right? We have like, well, you all know, what's it like to go swimming in August or late, you know, late August, early September in the Gulf? It's really, it's pretty warm water, right? It's like 90 degree water. So this is very warm water. It starts streaming across. And you might notice that that warm water makes a beeline for England, okay? So could you kind of understand why this was maybe an important current for like the history of our country, right? Being an English colony, we have kind of a direct, you know, a direct current going straight, taking you straight from the coast of the colonies straight to England, right? So that was you could imagine how important that current was for for uh, trade with with right, with England and with Europe. So it's a big deal. Um, now notice that the canary current now it's shown kind of in a lighter, you know, like a nice light blue color, which is reflecting that it's kind of gotten colder. Okay? And it's gotten colder because, hey, it's been at a high latitude for a while, and now it's cooled off. Okay? So what makes these gyres rotate like this? It's a little bit more complicated than what meets the eye, and I'm going to go into all the juicy, meaty details of what, what makes it tick. Okay. 
So you did number nine, right? You got your, your currents drawn in, right? Now, take a look at this. Yellow shows the trade winds here, the major wind patterns, okay? Yellow up here, the westerlies. Hmm, now take a look at this, see if this makes sense. Look at the trade winds here. Do you notice that the north equatorial current is being deflected to the right of the trade winds? You see that? It's not following the trade winds, it's being deflected to the right of the trade winds. Does that make you think of anything in the northern hemisphere? A deflection to the right in the northern hemisphere? Core, yes, yeah, very good, yeah, good, yeah. So you got the Coriolis effect. Oh, and look up here, a deflection to the right, northern hemisphere, Coriolis effect. All right, so you should see this, you'd be like, you should see, whenever you see this, this arrow is going, and then there's another arrow, and it's being deflected to the right, it's the northern hemisphere, you should think, Coriolis effect, Coriolis effect, okay, so... You can see the Coriolis effect is playing a role here, right? I hope everybody can see that. So it says, number 10, why do ocean currents not move in the same direction as the major surface wind patterns? Why? Coriolis effect, yeah. Same reason that winds, wind doesn't move in the same direction as the pressure gradient force, Coriolis effect. Okay, because things are always trying to move and to, you know, they're always getting deflected. The fluids are always getting deflected by the, by the uh, Coriolis effect. Now, one thing that happens, this is really crazy. So this is something that happens in the ocean, but it doesn't happen with the wind patterns. And there's something called Ekman transport. Ekman transport. And something that's really crazy, I'll tell you this, this is just what blows my mind. So let's say that the wind is blowing the ocean, let's just say it's blowing it to the east, okay? If you go down to a certain depth, the water is going to be moving to the west, completely 180 degrees backwards relative to the wind direction. Isn't that crazy? So the wind is, and it's being, so the wind is blowing it. Can you imagine? The ocean is moving backwards relative to the wind direction at a certain depth. Okay, and I'll explain why. It's, it's kind of interesting. I find this very interesting. Maybe you don't, but I find it very interesting. Okay, so think about this. So you see the wind, right? So this is the surface. Do you all see this? This is called an Ekman spiral. It's called an Ekman spiral. I actually have a picture of it there next to number 11 and 12, you see that? So this is called an Ekman spiral. Now here's, here's the wind, right? Now the surface current at the very top is being blown by the wind, and it's being deflected to the right because of Coriolis force, right? Think about this though. The layer underneath that, can that layer, like let's say 10 meters down, can it feel the wind? Yeah. It can't feel the wind, right? So it's moving because the water on top of it's moving. But guess what? It's going to be deflected to the right relative to that water above it. It's going to be deflected to the right relative to the water above it because it's not being driven by the wind. It's being driven by the water above it. So imagine a deck of playing cards and imagine you were moving you, you kind of had your finger on the deck and you were pushing the deck of cards. Your finger is the wind, right? But the cards underneath are moving because the cards above are moving, right? They're not moving because of your finger, they're moving because the card above it is moving it. So the same thing is happening here. The water on top is moving the water directly below it, but guess what? It's gonna def get deflected to the right of the water above it. And then the water below that is going to get deflected to the right from the water, water above it, right? And then, then the water even lower is going to get deflected to the right of the water above that. And so on and so on and so forth. Till you get all the way down, the water is actually moving backwards. 
Isn't that weird? It's very weird, but it's, that's what happens with Coriolis effect in the ocean. So do you think you can all, can, does that make sense to everybody? Does that, can everybody kind of understand that? It's because the driving force, the wind, is only acting upon the very surface of the water. The subsequent layers beneath are moving because they're being driven by the layers above it. So can you all explain that? Can you all do number 11 and actually explain that thoroughly? Be able to explain that back to me? So why does it move? What is that going to trans Why does it move in a different direction than the surface winds? Well, it's, it's because of Coriolis force. It's being deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere. Um, and then as you go on to number 12, so why do the circles get smaller so why, do, why does it, it's because, it's because uh, the wind is, of course, the wind is the ultimate driving force. The stuff below is getting driven by the stuff above, but at every step you're losing energy, right? It's the same thing, you actually, actually see the same effect in the playing cards, right? The top card moves the most, the cards subsequently underneath move less and less and less and less and less, because you're losing energy every time that you you go down deeper, okay? So you'll notice that the magnitude of the current decreases as you go down, and, the, and then also the um, direction of movement continually shifts to the right. So that creates that weird spiral shape. All right, so can, did everybody manage to do number 11 and 12? Makes sense to everybody? Because I could ask you on the final exam, I could, you know, try to explain this whole Ek Ekman transport back to me. Okay, and explain why you get this weird, you know, I, maybe it's good for you all to practice that a little bit, you know, practice. Can you explain back to me why you would get movement of water completely 180 degrees opposite of the direction of the winds? So. You should be able to do that with a test later. Less than a month away. So less than a month away. So which what do you think you should be doing to prepare for the test, by the way? Studying your lecture, lecture assignments and think what's that? Is there a final study guide? Definitely, there's a final study guide. It's up there right now. You can, and I can print it out. Um, would you all like it if I just printed it out early and you yes. started working on it? I should do that because you know I did that in my earth science class and I thought that worked out really well. I printed it out like super early and people were filling it out as they went along. So, um, would anybody like one? Should I, should I print some out right now? Like maybe bring it Wednesday. Okay. Can you raise your hand so I can get a count? Oh, okay. All right. I'll just, I'll just print out 18. Uh, I can't remember how many students we have. 20. No. Okay. Why bother? I, you know, I realize I have to change these packets, so I, I, so I should just put it in the packet. You know, so I'm going to do that next next time I teach this class. But anyway. Uh, so what's the? Oh wait, number 13. Why does the North Equatorial Current proceed directly west rather than curve to the right, as might be expected from the coordinates? So, okay, so we talked about we talked about the effect of wind. We talked about the effect of wind. Then Coriolis effect takes over. Okay, but there's still other factors that influence the direction of the currents. Okay. So um, any moving fluid will be deflected to the right by the Coriolis effect in the northern hemisphere to the left in the southern hemisphere. You all know that now. But remember that any moving fluid will be deflected to the right by the Coriolis effect. Okay, there's Ekman. I already kind of, this is, by the way, I just kind of put this up here so that if you want to come back later, this, this slide just has a lot of information of what I've already explained. So if you want to come back and just look at, it's kind of just a reference slide. Um, Here's a little GIF showing 
Ekman transport. Okay. Ekman spiral. All right, now, notice something else here. This is number 13. Uh, why does the water flow straight west instead of just turning to the right? Because you might, you might expect, I need, gosh, all the markers are gone. What is going on here? You notice that a straight turn to the right maybe would be like that. See what I mean? So the actual direction is not matching what we might expect just from Coriolis force. So I want to let you know there are other factors that get involved here. Okay, there's other factors that get involved. So what do we what do we have? We're at 11:30 now. So there are other factors that get involved. Let's talk about those. Okay, so we'll take a look at the North Equatorial Current in the North Atlantic Gyre, okay? This has to do with pressure gradient force in the ocean. So you know we have pressure gradient force. I hope you remember we have pressure gradient force in the atmosphere. We also have pressure gradient force in the ocean. Because believe it or not, we can have parts of the ocean with higher pressure and lower pressure. And what's actually happening is that the places with higher pressure, the water is literally stacking up in like a hill. Remember how I told you there's actually hills and valleys in the ocean? There are definitely hills and valleys, okay? So those places that have hills of water are going to be at a relatively higher pressure. Places with valleys of water are going to be at a relatively lower pressure. Okay. Just like in the atmosphere, where we're going to have like when the when you get ascending air or descending air, it can create pressure differences. So we get the same effect here. All right, this is a this is crazy. This is a topographic map of the surface of the ocean. So it's showing where the hills and the valleys are in the ocean, where the high parts are and where the low parts are. So where are some of the high parts? Look right off of kind of if you go down. A little south of Japan, you go down to Guam, that area. It's like a, it's like a ocean mountain there. It's like the plateaus, like the Himalayan plateaus of the ocean. So the, the ocean water is literally, it's, it's higher. And it's, it's actually, you can see how much higher is it than the mean, than the average? It's white color. So how high are these hills? One, so, 1.6 meters, right? 660. So it's about um, maybe as high, maybe as tall as I am on a good day. Um, so it's, you know, that's a hill. You know, it comes water. You know, you should be impressed that there's a hill in general, right? So, so anyway, uh, but those are the hills, and then you can see there are kind of like valleys down here in like the Southern Ocean. Right? So there are hills and valleys. So. That creates areas of high pressure and low pressure, and it will direct and control the flow of water. Because you can imagine, water's not going to want to flow uphill, right? If the water wants to flow on top of this hill, it's got to climb up, 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 up. So why do you think the water on top of this hill just doesn't all flow down and just be perfectly flat. Shouldn't it, doesn't that seem like that's what should happen? It should all flow down and be perfectly flat? But it doesn't do that. So any ideas why that might happen? What's that? You said the last couple of years on how water has hills is because of the ocean floor. Yeah, that's that's part of it, yeah. Yeah. That makes up that makes a small part of it that plays a role. Another thing is just this, these sustained wind patterns, right? Because remember you have the trade winds and the westerlies. So literally, what's happening is the the constant blowing wind from the trade winds is kind of stacking up the water and building up the water. And so it actually that's what's creating these mountains of water. Okay. So you can see there's going to be a balancing act between the force of the trade winds or the force of the westerlies and gravity, right? Because gravity, of course, gravity is going to make the water want to flow down. It just doesn't, water doesn't want to be on top of the hill, right? Water's going to want to flow down. 
All right, so there's um, right here, you'll notice that our big hill is kind of like off the coast of Florida and the Caribbean, things like that, okay? So water's gonna get kind of deflected away from that hill, okay, that's off the coast of Florida and the Caribbean. So the water's maybe getting pushed this way. There's a pressure gradient pull down this way because it doesn't wanna climb up the hill, the water hill, okay? So what ends up happening is the water just flows, you know, at some at some level between them. Okay. So there's a Coriolis force push this way. There's a pressure gradient force this way. So the water goes straight to the west. Okay. We call that, and you might be like, oh, what do I put for number thirteen? Uh, because that seems like a lot to explain. Luckily, we have a name for this effect. It's called the geostrophic effect. Geostrophic. Geostrophic balance. What's that? Uh, I thought it was for number 14. Oh, yes. Number 13, I guess number 13 and number 14 are kind of the same. You just have to explain, okay, there's, there's this geostrophic balance that is also deflecting um, and controlling the, the direction of water movement. So it's not just wind and Coriolis effect. What's the term of that balance of forces? It's geostrophic, geostrophic balance. Okay, so everybody got that? Sound good? Um, this is more on geostrophic balance. I don't know how much, I think, I think you get the picture. I hope you get the picture. All right, now, those are kind of the main effects that are controlling direction of currents, okay? So this is gonna create these six gyres in the ocean. So all these things combined together, you get six gyres. You get the North Atlantic gyre, we already talked about that, and you have the South Atlantic gyre. You have the North Pacific gyre, you have the South Pacific gyre. You have the Indian Ocean gyre, the Indian Ocean is only in the Southern Hemisphere for the most part, so we'd only have one Indian Ocean gyre. And then finally you get this last one called the Ant Antarctic Circumpolar Current. Some people also call it the Windward Current or the Windward Drift. So there's a lot of names for this last one. This one is crazy. Now notice that the this Antarctic gyre is different than all the other gyres. Because all the other gyres are kind of going, you know, like this. But this one is actually just rotating constantly around the, um, you'd, if you were looking at the South Pole, it would look like a gyre, just circum, going around the, the South Pole constantly, okay? This is a big, big deal because it creates uh, it creates this um, basically endless, endless, um, like an endless treadmill, you know, going around and around and around, and it creates the largest waves. So we're going to talk about this. We talk about you know, lecture twenty is going to be on waves. We talk about this one a lot because it creates the biggest waves in the Antarctic Ocean there, the Southern Ocean. So these major ocean currents explain some anomalies in temperature. Has anyone ever swam in the Pacific Ocean, like off the coast of California? Okay, temperature, so Julia and Alex, what do you think of the temperature? Here, was it in California or? Malibu. Yeah, oh, Malibu, yeah, Malibu is nice. Um, it was cold, right? It's cold, and if you're from here and you're used to swimming in the Gulf of Mexico and then you go there, you're like, Wow, it's, it's cold, right? It's cold. You need a wetsuit. People that are surfers, they usually wear wetsuits. Um, I grew up in Southern California. My dad was a big surfer. I never wore a wetsuit. A lot of, most people wear wetsuits. But wetsuits keep you warm you know, when you're in the ocean. So it's, it's cold, it gets cold there. Uh, now why does it get so cold? It's because of these currents, okay? So you can actually see these, this is actually the temperature of the water, right? And you can see these currents um, 
Like for example, along the coast of California, notice it's colder along California than it is down where, where we're at, right? Because we have the Gulf Stream current, it's very warm water, but the, the California current is bringing water from the Arctic down to the south, right? So that, that brings the cold water down along the coast of California, okay? Similarly, along the coast of Argentina, you get a similar effect. You get cold Arctic waters being brought, being brought up. And those are really important for the fisheries, by the way. We're going to see that. Because cold water, what does cold water have a lot of? Does anybody remember? What dissolves easily in the cold water? Oh, the other one, the other gas. Do you remember what it dissolves really? Because remember, gases dissolve into cold water more easily, right? So they have more oxygen. So these, so these cold water currents have a lot of oxygen. And so they end up being very important to the fisheries here. They're usually very nutrient rich and rich in oxygen. So they're, they're very fertile water and it, it creates a lot of marine life. So these, off the coast of Argentina, it's great fishing. They're off the coast of California, also important, you know, great fisheries there, so. All right, so those major ocean currents explain some of the weird temperature anomalies in the ocean. Because notice, look, off the coast of like New York, wouldn't you expect the water to be colder than off the coast of California, right? But look, that's yellow right there, and right there it's blue. Right off the coast of Southern California, okay. So that's that's created by the currents, by the gyres. Okay. So um, we're going to talk. We're going to look more closely now at the kinds of currents in a gyre. So we're going to kind of dissect the gyres, okay. And we're going to look specifically at the currents, okay. So remember, there are four currents in the North Atlantic gyre, right? Four currents, and we're going to look right now at the Gulf Stream and the other things that are kind of like the Gulf Stream and the other gyres. So uh, there's the Gulf Stream. These are called Western Boundary Currents. They're called Western Boundary Currents because they are making the Western Boundary of the gyre. Okay, so do you see how like the Gulf Stream is the Western Boundary of the North Atlantic gyre? The boundary on the left. We should call it the left boundary current, but it's, it's the west, so we call it the western boundary current. Okay. So here are some western boundary currents. There's the Gulf Stream, there's the Brazilian, the East Australian, the Kuroshio, that's off the coast of Japan, which is why it has that name, it sounds Japanese, and the um, Agulas. I always really pronounce that very, very well, but Agulhas, which is going off the coast of like South Africa. Okay, notice that in the south, those, those currents are going towards the south, but in the north, they're going towards the north, okay? So what are they? They are on the western edge of the ocean basins, and they are warm and fast. These currents are warm and fast, all of them, okay? All of them are warm and fast. So all western boundary currents are warm and they're fast. They occur along the coasts. They're going, you know, either to the north and the north or to the south and the south. The Gulf Stream in particular, like I said, very important to the history of our country makes a beeline from the, from the east coast of our country straight to the British Isles, right? So uh, it's very strong. It's actually one of the strongest currents in the ocean, the Gulf Stream is. Warm western boundary current flows from the Gulf of Mexico to Western Europe. And can you see that? Can you see it? You can literally see it in this map. This is, of course, this, those are the Great Lakes there. There's New York. And uh, there's Florida down there, right? And so you can literally see this flowing uh, current of water. Let me 
I'm going to take this away. Any guesses with this place? Where do you think this would be located? If you had to guess, what would you guess this is where this is located? It's a lush tropical scene. Do you think it's in Corpus Christi? No. Everything knows it. It's got a lot of palm trees. I don't know. Does anybody want to guess? So okay, I'll give you the answer, which I think is really interesting. This is actually an island off the coast of um, England. Is that, is that what you think of England looking like? So this is called, I kid you not, this is called the Isle of Scilly. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it's spelled differently. But anyway, this island is Scilly, uh, Scilly Isle. It's on the west side of England, and it's warmed up by that Gulf Stream. So that Gulf Stream is, we're bringing all of our nice Gulf Mexico warm water. It makes a beeline for England and it warms up the west coast of England big time. You know? And this is kind of crazy. Think about this. This island is at 50 degrees north. 50 degrees north. Okay. Michigan, where I, you know, I used to live in Michigan, it's a cold place, is at 42 degrees north. This is even this place is even further north than Michigan. Or Minnesota even. Isn't that crazy when you think of it? Think of Minnesota. It's cold. Has anyone ever been to Minnesota or Michigan? A uh, cold place. Yeah. Yeah, I'll show you this. This is crazy. This is at the same latitude as this. But this is in Siberia at the same latitude, right? But isn't that crazy? Same latitude, but totally, utterly, completely different climates. What's controlling the climate here is because Right, it's it's getting all this warm water from the Gulf, and it's it's warming it up. Okay, so I mean, a big reason that Western Europe has the relatively temperate, nice climate that it does is because of the Gulf Stream. If it didn't have the Gulf Stream, Western Europe would be not really a nice place to live. It'd be very cold. Right, it would be like it would be more like this. Right, so but it gets warmed up by the Gulf. So it's, it's a big deal. Okay, flow speed is about 2.2 miles per hour. So you can see, really, it goes really fast here along the coast of Florida up and then spreads out as it becomes the, um, uh, as it goes across uh, to, the, to the east, okay? Now I wanted to point something else out. Oh, and this is kind of cool. You can, you can, I'm gonna turn off some more of the lights so you can see that now. Okay, can you see the different colors of blue here? So you can literally see the Gulf Stream here. This is off the co coast of North Carolina, I think. It's a, off the coast of one of the Carolinas. And do you see how there's this kind of lighter blue color? That's the Gulf Stream. And do you see how this has clouds? And this darker water doesn't have so many clouds? It's because this is more humid because it's, it's warmer water. So it's, it's evaporating more and it's giving off more humidity. This water here that's darker is is colder and it's more nutrient rich and it's um it doesn't actually have as much phytoplankton as, as this water so anyway that's what creates the color differences so lighter blue waters from the gulf those are warmer do not support as much life as the darker nutrient rich waters which are green with phytoplankton notice the clouds from above gulf streams since more water evaporates all out of the one so can you actually see the green? Do you see the green here? Can you see those like that's the phytoplankton, the green algae? Okay. So colder water, you're gonna find that colder water is usually more nutrient rich, it's more oxygenated, and it supports, it can actually, contrary to what you might expect, it can actually support, it's a little bit more fertile for phytoplankton. Okay. So there's some um, these are some ancient, ancient, I shouldn't call it ancient, some historical maps of the Gulf Stream uh, from the 1700s. I think actually, if I'm not mistaken, this might actually be a map that Benjamin Franklin developed, but it's a, it's a map, you know, plotting out the Gulf Stream, because you can imagine, historically very important. Okay. Um, here's flow rates of different river, or different currents, sorry. Um, I don't think I have anything to say too much. I don't want, this is kind of small and hard to see, but I gotta maybe replace that one. Um, so what are we at? Oh, we got to talk about eddies, huh? You see all the swirlies here, right? So this is the Gulf Stream. 
and you see all the swirlies. Okay, so those swirlies are called eddies. And there are these self-enclosed, you know, circulation, they're kind of like small uh, cir uh, circulating, um, circulating, what's a, what's a good word for it? Let me see how I do it. Turbulent rings of spiraling water, that sounds good. That's a good way to describe it. But there are these kind of smaller, you know, they're much smaller than a gyre, and they're circulating, spiraling water. Now, eddies can either be, we actually, they can either be warm or cold, and depending on whether they're warm or cold will actually determine the direction they spin, whether clockwise or counterclockwise. So they're hot core or cold core. Hot core or cold core. Do you see how the cold core ones spin counterclockwise and the hot core ones spin clockwise? And that's because in the, in the hot core ones, the water's rising. It's kind of like, remember when we talked about like cyclones and the anticyclones in the atmospheric lectures, right? <coughs> you have situations where, air is ri where the air is like rising and, and, and spiraling out, and you have other situations where it's spiraling in. So in the cold core, the water's denser, and so it's kind of almost like a low pressure system or analogous to that. The cold water is sinking, and it's bringing, it's bringing fresh water in. So it's kind of an inward spiral that creates that counterclockwise movement. Okay. So do you see how the eddies form? The eddies form when the Gulf Stream current pinches off. Do you see that? So that's how those eddies form. Now, these are important. These are important because these eddies, if you, so imagine this. Let me see if I got a good map. Yeah, imagine this. All the water circulation is going on on the boundaries around the gyre, right? Very little fresh water is brought into the center of the gyre. So the center of these gyres are usually very nutrient depleted and they're not very fertile. They don't have a lot of nutrients and they don't have a lot of oxygen anymore because there's just not a lot of fresh water moving in and out of them. So they get depleted very easily. So these eddies, these eddies are one of the few things that are capable of bringing nutrients. You see how this, how these can kind of rotate into the center of the gyre and bring nutrients into the middle of the gyre. That's why these are important for the ecosystems in the center of the gyres. So it's one of the few mechanisms the ocean has of delivering nutrients into the center of a gyre. What causes eddies? I ask a question, what causes eddies? It's when the current, it's when the current pinches off. See, like that, there you go. And that creates, that can create an eddy. It's just like if you've ever seen, I'm sure you've seen smoke rising, things like that, creates eddies like that. So eddies are important for delivering nutrients into the depleted water in the interiors of gyres, the inside of the gyres. Okay, so last thing we're going to talk, look at, look at my watch here. What time is it? So, I feel like it was already 11.55. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. I hate not having a watch. Okay, last last little thing I gotta talk about and we'll be done. Okay, I'll send you send you off. So eastern boundary currents. So we have western boundary currents, now we have eastern boundary currents. So these are things like the California current, the Canary Island current. The Benguela current over here in the South Atlantic. Another important one, this is a very important one right here, the Humboldt current that goes off the coast of Chile. That's very important for, like I said, the fisheries there. It's very important for the sustaining the fishing economies there. Humboldt current and the West Australian current. All right, now, eastern, eastern currents carry cool water towards the equator. So notice that the western currents are always going towards the poles. 
eastern currents go towards the equator. Okay? So they go towards the equator. Instead of carrying hot, warm water, they're carrying cool water. So these are nice, cold, rich in nutrients, rich in oxygen. These tend to be wider and more shallow and also slower. And because they're move, moving more slowly, eddies do not form off of them so, so easily. So western boundary currents are mostly responsible for developing the eddies that deliver nutrients to the interior of gyres. Western currents, much stronger, they get something called the western intensification we'll talk about later. Coriolis affects a major contribution trade winds, um, okay, so you see this is a good comparison at Eastern Western. Okay, so um, just a little bit more comparison of boundary currents, Western and Eastern. Eastern, cool water, okay, with low salinity, high oxygen, nutrient-rich waters, high biomass. Okay. All right, so that's it. So we can stop there. All right, so I will see you Wednesday and um, leave, what, what do we want to leave? Number 17 today, right? So please leave lecture assignment number 17. And I think that's all I have to say. Okay, so y'all have a good one and I'll see you next time.